Hello everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode in the Jams and Deep Podcasts list week of 2021. We've made it, and we've made it through the absolute fucking nadir of the worst songs and the worst albums of the year. We made it, we made it. And now we get to take a moment to revel in the positive. To, to, to talk about that which we have cherished dearly, what has pushed us through this, this absolute hell of a year, 2021. We get to talk about the best songs of the year. Uh. I mean, this is exciting. I mean, last year we had a fun time doing this, but of course this year, first year where we've done the podcast for the whole 12 months. So we have a lot more material to draw on. I think we've also revised the rules about how we compile these lists as well to make the list a bit more representative of our like actual real high quality, thick, high caliber stuff. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of contentious inclusions, possibly um, maybe some snubs that you guys might want to get mad at us for. But today we're counting down the 20 best songs of the year in our opinion two days from now we'll be doing the best albums of the year as well there'll be some artist overlap between the two of them but we'll try and keep these videos as discreet from each other as possible but yeah happy fucking merry fucking christmas let's get into it if baby jesus is an asshole I think that Hardline is one of Julian's best songs. I think it's one of her best sounding songs. Uh, I think that like everything on Little Oblivions is such an exciting sonic direction for her to take her sound in. She has, you know, she started off as the more plaintive uh, indie singer songwriter and now she's like a full blown like act. She's using her band a whole lot more and that full sound that comes from the band really shows itself here. Um, like just the sound of it is honestly reason enough to love it. I just like the huge blaring organs that start off this song and eventually like cascade into the really euphoric rises later in the track are just absolutely fucking fantastic. And this is just a great encapsulation of Little Oblivions as a whole. It's a song that's rife with a whole lot of pain and honesty, Julian talking about like addiction, what have you. And it, it's just like one of those songs that I come back to and is just as emotionally affecting as the first time that I heard it. Yeah, I've, I've always appreciated when Julian like really gets like pulls open the curtains in the word of Chris, words of Christian Holden and just makes a really fucking expansive, loud banger. Because I think that her yes. voice, her, the particular tones of her voice and the way she's able to really holler are like really well suited to that. Like one of my favorite Julian Baker songs is Turn Out the Lights, which has a finale yes. that, you know, ends in a similar sort of way as this song really kind of crests on its chorus. And so, yeah, I completely co signed this being one of Julian's best songs ever. It came out in the second week of the year. So it's kind of fitting that we talk about it first in our list um amazing amazing track we move then to number 19 on our list which is this song i think is a really great way of kind of segueing from Deaf Heaven's more sort of aggressive and you know black metal influenced sound into the current guys that they're sitting in, which is very, very heavily leaning into the shoegazier aspects of their sound, the more anthemic aspects of their sound. There's beautiful balance between the more soulful crooning that George Clark is doing a lot more of now, and even some of the kind of hints of the harsher stuff that he has obviously lent on pretty heavily in the past but this is much much more in that kind of like you know pool of gorgeous sound sort of mode and uh, my pick actually from this band for the end of year list was actually in blur which is the song that follows it on the album which i think frankly i mean any qualities of praise you would want to put on shell star would equally apply to that song as well it works in a very similar mode but i think it has some of the strongest hooks the band have ever um, created and they're not necessarily a band that have ever necessarily been known for hooks or sort of vocal refrains or anything like that but 
for as contentious as this album has been in the kind of wider world, I think that these two songs, and particularly a song like Shell Star, which is the one on our list, really demonstrate how masterfully Deaf Heaven have negotiated this transition into a new sound. And I mean, for all the people who say, well, they're not black metal anymore, or black gays anymore. I mean, like, if you want to, if you sit down and compare this to any Joe Shoegaze band and you tell me this is like as good as any fucking mediocre shoegaze band then you have to i would have to question your hearing because they are yes they're doing a sound that might sound tired or um, played out to some people but they're doing it with such a gusto and with such an instrumental presence and with such a kind of widescreen scope and the way they make it sound that is so true to what deep heaven have always been but also elevates them above so many bands of their ilk of an album like infinite granite so yeah shell star hell of a song just put it on in the car and and i mean fucking weep down the freeway um speaking of which no surprises that we have you know plenty of emotional whirlwinds on this list i mean we're fucking gonna be three for three here with a number 18 pick which is a lesser heard song from an up-and-coming artist who was one of the first artists that we reviewed this whole year and an artist that we shouted out in our overlooks overlooked albums video which came out last week and an artist who i think she would tell you herself with this song really set out to make the song of her musical career up to this point and that's absolutely what it is and the song is dress by fell from the tree uh if you like bedroom pop if you like indie pop if you like uh music about being queer slash trans and the experience of transitioning of coming to terms with your identity of the sense of belonging that you may feel or may not feel within the community that surrounds you or the community that you seek to embrace. If any of these feelings are familiar to you, there's a phone number on the screen. I mean, just kidding. There is a song <laughs> for you to listen to right now called Dress from Fell from the Tree. It deserves so much more love than it's gotten. Um, I, I although I would wager that just about anyone who's heard the song would tell you it's a fucking great song, regardless of their yes. connections to Hannah, who is the wonderful songwriter and musician and producer behind it. But yeah, beautiful bedroom pop, synth pop, ballad slash banger. It's kind of both of those things at the same time, and it swells and builds to the quite a cathartic release across its six minute runtime that. Um, really will, I think, make it an immediate standout to anyone who resonates with any of the things that I've brought up so far with regard to this song. Like, it's just truly a, a remarkable achievement for a young budding songwriter and clearly a sign of how ambitious that Hannah intends to be with her future projects. And I'm so, so excited that, and I mean, this being, this album, again, like with Julian, this song came out at the start of the year, but it's still stuck with us. It's still resonated in our head. I mean, it made three of our individual songs of the year lists. So that's a testament. One of only three songs on this list to have more than two people pick it. Yeah. So that's a testament to its staying power and its presence throughout this whole year. Um, it's, it's a really, really special song. Very much agree. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to Hannah just because this has been a song I've just listened to fucking endlessly all year long uh for every reason that I think that you probably like every reason that you made it is the a reason that it meant the world to me so thank you very much well moving on then to our number 17 on our list and it's time to get weird <laughs> So John 50, I think, really resonates with me because John 50 is a place where I think uh, Black Midi's influences are most directly felt. Like on the vocals, you can hear the primus. You can hear the Frank Zappa in the instrumentation. You can hear the uh, just general prog and post-punk adjacent influences. Big all, King Crimson influence. Big King song. Crimson, mm. absolutely. All smushed together 
into this one song. And even though these, these elements are individually identifiable, at least to me, they never fail to bring their own personality, their own spin to this song. It was a lead single for the album, and it has just this monstrous, tremendous energy. And it also doesn't give away every secret the album has hidden within it. So I think it's a really perfect song to have on the list as just a great dosage of bizarre cultish storytelling and just proggy post-punky fun yeah like when there's i always felt that like initially black midi were this really really talented and promising band they had a lot of instrumental acumen i mean shout out to their drummer morgan simpson who's one of the best drummers in a modern working band unquestionably but i was waiting for them to really like for, for, for the stars to really align with this band, because it felt like with their debut record, Schlagenheim, they were really just warming up. And then John 50 dropped as the lead single from the album, as you said. And it was like this holy grail moment where it was like, this, this is exactly what I wanted. This The kind of shit that I wanted this band to do, but also the kind of shit that I didn't know I wanted this band to do. Like, it's, it's so utterly gonzo is so utterly bananas it is so relentlessly forward moving it's shifting it's strained within its five minutes it has an absolutely absurd breakdowns and and high tempo speeds i've watched live recordings of this song where if you can believe this they actually double the tempo when they play it i think they call it john 100 or something like it's it's totally hilarious they're a very they're a very funny band um but yeah amazing amazing song that is almost kind of like an instrumental flex more than anything else but then you kind of sit with it and you realize it's actually you know quite a an intricate song even in terms of storytelling like it, it's a song essentially about a, an, an a sort of apocryphal uh malevolent leader and the how he is overthrown by his subjugated people uh, its music video is delightfully absurd and it, as though it were directed by David Lynch. It's just absolutely everything you could hope for from this band. And I mean, a really, really impressive song. Number 16 on our list. And let's get synth poppy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's no surprise if you watched our segment that uh, the newest Church's album is basically my front runner for pop album of the year. And naturally, of course, the, the best song on it, the song that I said was one of my favorite songs of the year, is in fact on here. Uh, and yeah, How Not to Drown is just, God, it's, it's the band operating at the height of their power not just in the way that like they're a pop band that's executing a pop song very well, but they're going beyond that. They're making something that's instrumentally ambitious. They're including fucking Robert Smith of The Cure, which, okay, I'm going to admit, it's like this little bit of a cheat code with me. It, it's going to be really, really hard to fuck up your song if you put Robert Smith on it. That's just, you know, they, and not to mention, he and the lead singer have incredible vocal chemistry like the once the the song hits its second verse and the his vocals come on there and they harmonize together the song becomes a, a another world levels of good but this is a absolutely like dark pitch black thematically really really grueling song this is a a song that really epitomizes the album it's really getting in the weeds of the uh tangly naughty abusive relationship that this album is uh, frequently uh, speaking to and i just love the way this sounds the chorus is so fucking huge it's enormous it's catchy somehow even though it's not as traditionally bright or or you know peppy like another church's song or a pop song in general and then that final segment of it where it just kind of mellows out and just sort of lets you wade in it i mean how not to drown is such an apt title because the whole song feels so claustrophobic and like you can't breathe because everything almost feels like it's suffocating you and it's just one of those things that combines everything about why churches are a great band and just like somehow manages to be a great pop song that also sort of pushes the the boundaries of what like a great pop song can even be in this day and age so yeah fuck yes how not to drown 
ever since I heard Robert Smith sing on a remix of a Crystal Castle song actually years ago called Not In Love, where he just like took over this kind of really abrasive, loud sort of synth poppy banger with his, his, these absolutely heartbreaking vocals. And I realized like, holy shit, this guy I've always associated with kind of like weepy, you know, downbeat kind of guitar pop actually fits really well into the world of synth and electronic pop music. And obviously he's covered the Twilight Sad's Girl in the Corner as well, which is a synth pop song too. Well, a, a synth post-punk song. Um, so yeah, it's no surprise that he's such a great fit here. And it's kind of like churches have kind of pulled a trump card with um, managing to land him on this. Moving forward to the number 15 on our list of the best songs of the year. And we have... <laughs> Black Dresses are a band that I think they're one of those artists that because we covered them so early in our podcast sort of infancy, I feel like they'll kind of always be tied to the podcast in my mind anyway when I think about them. Uh, and so obviously their album from this year, Forever in Your Heart, was a huge hit with us on the podcast, which was a nice surprise considering how divisive last year's Peaceful as Hell was here. And nowhere on the record is what makes this such a, an incisive and thrilling and for black dresses somewhat accessible. Um, that's with a big caveat, obviously. Um, musical direction for them is that they have essentially streamlined and focused the grindcore influenced electro industrial noise pop music that have made into its most finessed into its most impactful and into a form that's slightly less avant-garde than it's been in the past which i think has been the special secret source to really having their music connect with all of us this year not losing the personality and the uniqueness and the strangeness that's always characterized them but refining and shaping it into something that is just really really easy to throw on and enjoy as a pure banger without having your you know gray matter totally torn to shreds concrete bubble is fucking beast mode black dresses like this song is loud it's ugly it's noisy it kicks your fucking door down with that <laughs> like that that shit is like industrial fucking goodness it is trans nine inch nails crossover musicality that i never dreamed could work as well as it does Rock your body like a cattle plague indeed I mean, that, that, that to me is one of like the best like refrains of the year rock your body like a cattle plague oh, fuck yeah it's such like a, a violent kind of like uh you know uh contortion of the you know rock your body on the club on the floor cliche and also, like, it just worms its way into my head on a regular basis, no matter how long it's been since I've last heard the song. And I want to say, like, there's a lot of contenders for, you know, best song of the year on this record. Like, there are other tracks that I had to um, think about, like, Understanding and the Opener Peace Sign and a number of other tracks on this record that just kind of blow my mind still to this day. But Concrete Bubble, I think, is as good, as finessed, and as exciting an example of what makes Black Dresses such cutting-edge artists musically, um, as well as what makes their music some of the most enthralling and throttling and just viscerally cathartic for people like us who are essentially some variant of the target audience. August, you also had this song on your list. I'm sure you have some thoughts on why it's such a banger. At least from my perspective, this sounds just like Shinsei Kamate-chan if they used electric instruments and grindcore yeah. aesthetics. And it's awesome. And I like it for that reason. And also, it's just a cleverly written song, I find, uh, which, mm. you know, generally a, an aspect of black dresses that could easily go overlooked in the face of just how immediately oppressive and brutal their music is uh and yeah that's that's uh, kind of why i had it on my list uh number 14 on our list <laughs>
Genesis Arusu has really struck me mainly because of just the sheer versatility he's able to demonstrate. And to me, this is one of the most stunningly exciting and just fresh breaths of air. It's a fun kind of funky song with some synth pop, synth funk influences and it it takes those and makes for a really dark gritty song uh, in the form of centerfold that i've just found myself uh as the year has gone on returning to and returning to because of just how we we've got this uh simple it's the story of the song it's quite simple we go from this uh expression of affection that as the song progresses takes a darker and darker and darker turn and i i really love the almost morbid humor of this song as well as it's just iconic (laughs) vocal melodies that persist throughout it's it's a really fun exciting enchanting enthralling song and it it really makes me want to see more from genesis not necessarily in this style but just w- whatever he wants to do because he he is a very intelligent creative yeah i mean it's a song that sneaks up on you right like and i think a lot of the songs on this record have this quality even though some of them are quite like in your face and propulsive but their staying power, I think, has been one of the great pleasures and surprises of this year. I think a lot of it comes from the fact that you have what are essentially R&B slow jams in songs like this that are performed by a live band and yet have this sense of studio production over top of them as well that meshes in like integrates with the live band sound and gives you something that feels like really vibrant and especially because of the way it's produced like you're kind of there in the studio listening to them kind of like feel it out and that's like centerfold is such a kind of like slinky kind of groovy and slow and kind of almost seductive song that has that kind of like sensuality in it that the kind of lyrics sort of refer to Well, moving on then to the number 13 on our list, and we have a song that I've kind of brute forced my way onto this list, a song that for a short time this month, I very strongly toyed with making this my song of the year, and it's currently sitting in a very close second place, Uh, and that is... If we have any people who are as angry retentive as me out there, I'll get this off the bat straight away. I realize this song was originally released by Lil Ugly Main under the alias Bedwetter in November or December of last year. So it technically is a 2020 song. However, the version that was released under Bedwetter in 2020 is slightly different from the version that appears on his new album this year. And in ways which make, I think, the new album version definitely the superior of the two. It's just more cleaned up production-wise. It sounds a lot sharper. And it is driven by this looping guitar riff sample that I swear to you, or no word of hyperbole, has been in my head for at least some point of every day since I first heard this song. This is one of my most listened to songs of the year. I've racked up something like 120 scrubbles of this, and the album's only been out for a couple of months. This song is like my crack. I I cannot stop listening to it. And I mean, it's not even like it was tough to pick a song from this record, frankly, which itself has wormed its way up to be my second favorite album of the year. But this song in particular is is really, I think, one of the most exemplary examples of everything that Maine does, particularly in this era of his career, where he's kind of veered away from hip hop into making like uh, hip hop produced style, sorts of indie rock influenced, um, just genuine, genuine sad banger type shit. And headboard with that guitar riff sample, which is like bone chilling to me. 
It's got this really eerie, haunting, beautiful, but sad quality to it all at once. It's an amazing, amazing sample. And his sort of, you know, deep baritone singing uh, and, and rap, well, not rapping, but like his, he has a kind of cadence that approximates that, but this sort of deep baritone singing that he lays down on top of this track, the way that he kind of like stretches out the line of I'm free and on the kind of like hook part of this song when the sample really kicks into gear, the ways in which he kind of flips up the sample and adds different elements during the verses to like keep the song different and fresh, the ways in which it feels like the sample is kind of completely overtaking the song at the climax of the track. Like it's so blown out, it's so loud, it's so over the top, but it just like, it's like hearing, I don't know, a fucking My Bloody Valentine guitar riff for the first time. It's just so special. And this song to me has been such a salve this year, such a fucking, uh, an instant point of I need something to like calm me down and cool me off and just be comforted by music and it's I mean I mean there's just nothing else like it I mean and, and there's heaps of other contenders on this album and I'll talk about it a little bit more later on but uh, Jake I know you put a song from this album on this list as well the track VPN do you want to talk for a second about why that song was such a standout for you this year? A lot of the things you said could certainly apply to this. I would say that this is also like, for me personally, sort of been like a salve. I just, it sounds kind of skin deep, but a lot of it is just the way it sounds. From the start of it, it has that sort of shuffling drum beat and that kind of overwhelming crackling white noise. And just like the vocal melodies that on this sound so like they're very despondent but they're also kind of winding and very hypnotic everything about this song feels so hypnagogic and weird but it's also dense and heavy like once that chorus comes in and those like blaring shoegazy guitars are in the background and you have those really 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 like punctuated electronic hits the like boom boom Boom, boom. It, it just, it all swells together to create this, like, it, it feels like a dreamlike trance that, like, simultaneously relaxes me and just sort of shuts everything out. And that's kind of what the song is sort of, like, about, except sort of more in the context of the internet. It's a little bit more like uh, Lil Ugly Mane talking about the sort of circumstances of his identity and sort of coming through as like an artist on the internet and the like the the problems and isolations that can uh, come from that particularly so it's a very like uh, idiosyncratically written song but that doesn't diminish the emotional attachment that I have to it at all it's just something that allows me to sort of take everything, push it all away, close my eyes, lay down on my bed and just sort of lay in it. 100%. All right. Number 12 on our list. And we turn back to Morgan for some very, very hefty Morgan core. Oh, don't you say it took me some time to come around to the title track being my favorite on this particular album mostly just because i had to soak in how much i loved everything on it but over and over and over again this is, just for the record this is my second favorite song of the year and uh was number one for a very long time um but over and over again over the past few months since the album's release i've kept coming back to this song in particular and it's a lot like what we talked about, or not we, but what Tyler and Jake talked about on the uh, about headboard and VPN both, where this definitely does just feel like a, a salve whenever I am in less spectacular moods. I think of moments like the first time uh, Brandon Flowers gets up and really high in his register and sings the line. I don't remember you the last time you asked how I was. Um, and particularly way, the way that he delivers that line in that register just 
feels like a little bit of me is broken and healed at the same time every time I hear it. It's something really special, not just for this band, but for just in general for any band. West Hills, the opening track is not only is it one of the best opening tracks of the year, is that like I, I want to say this is the best song the killer's ever made. And it just goes, it's a test of it to pressure machine that I want to say that. And I'm like, there's like three other songs on this album that like, that are just as good. So like, yeah. fuck me, I guess. And like, sure. You can, you, you can say like all of the, you know, just like, Oh, this is just, you know, Springsteen, blah, 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 blah. Does it stop me from crying the moment in West Hills where it's uh, you know, where Brandon talks about dying and going to heaven and saying that God will know his heart. No. Uh, and this is like, again, this is like what we said in the review. This is the killers born to run. And it's as good as Born to Run. Yeah, if there's any group of people in the world who are equipped to recognize an instant classic in the genre of Heartland Rock, when it happens, it's us. Um, and we'll get more into the album itself uh, when that time comes. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more. Moving on to number 11 on our list, and we have another selection from Morgan primarily, but also Jake will heartily, I think all of us would heartily co-sign that this is an amazing, amazing song. And that is... This morning is amazing and so are you. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to articulate just over and over. I've obviously been going back to this song over and over again as the year's gone on. Uh, but the line I keep coming back to is what am I to do on this balcony, Fred, which is, doesn't mean much outside of the context of the song, but basically feels like in its own strange way, it feels like what this year in general has felt like, where it's like things are relatively normal. For I mean, in all regular senses, we just it, we do everything now, but sometimes with a mask on, and sometimes not even that. So it's it's like last year was us having to stay off of the balcony, and now we're on the balcony, and we have no idea what the hell to do about anything. And the the song and album in general so perfectly conveys that sort of confusion and reticence in such a specific and beautiful Nick Cavey way um, that it couldn't not make this list or one of these best lists in some capacity, I don't think. I feel like describing a late era Nick Cave song and like the appeal of it is next to fucking impossible in some ways just because you're like like everything about it is designed to be perfectly arresting and imbue you with an emotion that like doesn't make sense and that's like the entirety of carnage is that you're just constantly trying to figure out how it makes you feel and with each layer you uncover you appreciate it more and this is like the apex of that yeah, the thing that really struck me about Balcony Man, especially listening back to it, you know, for the purposes of this video and trying to sort of distinguish what it is about this song, is, I mean, one theme of a lot of Nick's writing recently on the last two records he's made in particular has been like the way that his relationship and connection to his wife and the love that he has for her has deepened mm -hmm. and changed and shifted in nature in the last sort of several years of their life together. And this to me is like one of the most beautiful songs he's ever written um, that appears at least to be about that specifically, um, but also the ways in which it's filtered through a distinct sort of pandemic lens because I think the the title and the image of the balcony dancer is actually an allusion to a story from early in the pandemic when um, you know people were just sort of starting to be locked inside and a number of people in I think somewhere in Italy or France were like going out onto their balconies couples were like going out on their balconies and dancing or like individual people were going out onto their balconies and dancing by themselves alone 
um, a, you know, along the street, all on their respective balconies, just dancing alone, but together. And that was an image that clearly stuck with Nick as something that really resonated in terms of uh, the, the nature and tone of the pandemic and how people were responding to it. And so by transfusing that or referencing that obliquely and tying it into the story about how each day he wakes up and is just utterly awed by the existence and presence of his wife and himself in this space, the fact they are alive this morning together. is amazing and so are you yeah exactly it, it, it's 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 re it really makes it a special special song um and and everything that makes nick such a unique and and moving songwriter in the last 10 years specifically uh is highlighted here uh on that note we move forward to the top 10 songs of the year here we go number 10 on this list and I mean, boy, oh boy, do we have a fucking doozy for you here. So this song is the best song of the year to me for a mixture of staying power and production emo just emotionality you know about everything about it performance what immediately strikes me is just the production of this and that this is a song that is so so clearly something you could have only really produced in the way it sounds in the past decade or so with the precision of the editing, the way uh, the way the individual words and lines on this song are pieced together, or pauses and breaths are cut out in a way that feels so distinctly unnatural, unnerving, and and generally unsettling. The the messaging of the song, of course, is quite important. This. Uh, grand reckoning with race relations in America, the whole I know that you know that I know, essentially taking a, a bit and turning it into this moving piece of, of social commentary, ostensibly. It's really just a song that is so deeply unsettling feeling. You get the sense that it could just fall apart from the frailty of the vocal performance, from the way the, the instrumental is delivered. And what truly transcends this song is when it does fall apart, when uh, Richie with a T's voice can't sustain the emotion of the song anymore. The instrumental can't sustain the emotion of the song anymore. And there's a breakdown about halfway through where the song becomes this swirling, hazy piece of electronic instrumentation. And that solid minute and a half, two minute section of this song is, is what makes it the, the greatest uh, triumph of the year for me. And that it's, it's taken what is fundamentally something that cannot be spoken uh, some something that just this emotion this tension that can't be put into words so you express it as as music it's the equivalent of a guitar solo except just so atmospheric emotionally moving and distressing i think it's a, a perfect song revisiting it this week to really kind of like try and get inside my inside your head in terms of like why this is such a significant song because it's always been a song I've struggled to like even approach and I, I like your description of like it puts into music something that can't be conveyed in words and of course a lot of music does that but what's so striking about outside is that it almost feels like it's a feeling or it's a sensation or it's something that's so unfathomable that it definitely can't be put into words and it can barely be put into music as well 
like it's almost as though music itself art is itself like expression in any form itself is almost like barely able to even convey the enormity the complexity the just holy shit it's extra dimensional yeah it's like it's a it's a it's a mixture of like you know of all of these different complicated feelings and sensations and reactions to the world and to personal traumas and to um, just general toxicity that is like this electronic cathartic scream of noise and static that's just absolutely blown apart and tattered it's like falling through space if instead of a vacuum you just had a wall of static around you it's unbelievable (laughs) Uh, and 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 yeah it's kind of one of those things that you just sort of have to admit that in the face of this you are powerless in the face of this music you are powerless to try and comprehend or describe or entrap it into the world of language you just have to kind of take it in moving forward through the top 10 number nine on our list is This is an artist where if we had agreed, if we had all agreed on a single song to include with this artist, because it's the only artist, I believe, who features on all four of our songs of the year list. But if we had agreed on a single song, it would undoubtedly be the song of the year for us. But the simple fact of the matter is this artist is so fucking good that all four of us picked a different song for from this artist. And so as a result of that, the, the one we're highlighting Uh, just happens to be the one that got the most highest ranking which is a song that I put on my list uh, as my favorite song of the year Paranul's Colors. Um, Morgan I know you're a huge fan of this song as well even though you picked a different Paranul song for your list. Do you want to just talk briefly introduce us to um, what's so beautiful about Paranul's sound and how it all kind of coalesces on a song like Colors for instance? I think what what strikes so many people about Paranormal is how clearly indebted to their influences they are, but also how singular they actually sound. Uh, Because Colors in particular sounds like a whole slew of shoegaze and emo influences that Paranormals are obviously taking from. But there's also just nothing that sounds like it other than other Paranormal songs. And like, I don't know what the hell kind of wizardry that is, uh, but I do know that every song here, even the ones that I didn't list, like Colors, make me feel some type of way and like Jesus. I mean, we're, and I in particular, I mean, suckers for music that's just like loud and the, for the purposes of catharsis. And of course, that's Paranormal's whole, whole MO, right? This pinnacle artist of fifth wave emo of this new you know wave of of emo that's taking like aspects of digital electronic music and like hyper pop and all this kind of like digitized internet era music and infusing that into the emo aesthetic and paranormal i think bar none and there were a lot of great artists who are doing this but paranormal bar none i think is the master of it and why colors is my song of the year is that it's a piece of music that truly keeps on giving no matter how well you know the artist and this is the thing right colors paranormal put out my album of the year in march august album of the year in march an album stacked with amazing songs that really fully lay out to you the whole aesthetic of this artist and then you got a song like colors on this split lp with asian glow and song host Kumam tonta that came out just a couple of months ago and it's like the song colors isn't necessarily doing anything new or surprising for the artist paranormal but it what is surprising about it is how despite 
the fact that it's clearly a paranormal so- song through and through, it still finds ways to surprise you with how breathtaking its beauty can go, like the heights that it can reach in terms of just pure staggering uh, levels of just sheer beauty, how that beauty can be infused with catharsis through the use of distortion and noise and those really kind of crackling riffs and how Paranul can take his influences and add something special, the secret source to the music that takes it above just being a really great shoegaze emo song into an utterly mind-melting piece of music when the piano comes in in the second half of the song. And it finds, you think the song's crested, you think the song has reached this beautiful crest halfway through, but then the piano loop comes in and the song turns and twists into something else and much like with the masterpiece that is white ceiling off of the album that paranormal put out to see the next part of the dream it feels like in the final minutes of this song you are reliving every beautiful memory that you've ever experienced in your life at the same time running through your head it's the kind of music that inspires those kinds of melodramatic uh you know over the top descriptions of like ecstatic uh, transcendence and the fact that Paranormal is able to isolate and do this in so many different ways on so many different songs that we have all represented on our lists is something really special. It just makes you yearn for something you don't have, some other distant place. It's tough to put into words is the problem, but That's also what's beautiful about it because you don't even need to understand Korean to get the intended emotion from it. I mean, I'm just listening to this and it's, it feels like the most miserable and happy thing ever at once. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, 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 I guess, emo music in general, but specifically what Paranormal does. It's, It's about the duality of that, about like how you can be the most miserable you've ever been in your life. And yet you can also feel like utterly ecstatic and euphoric. And there's no easy way to, maybe no way at all to comprehend or even translate that, except to make the music that Paranol and his fellow artists make. All right, now it's time for number eight on our list and it's time to get post-punky. What's so exciting about Squid's uh, narrator is that it is one of the best justifications of runtime of the entire year. This song is eight and a half minutes and spends its entire runtime building and building to its fever pitch climax, which is one of the most cathartic, exciting, just electrifying things to listen to. And I'll play my on- part! I play oh, my, my. A great collaboration as well because Squid bring on the solo artist Martha Sky Murphy onto this song as well. And essentially what they do with it is I get paint this kind of character portrait of this figure who is essentially kind of consumed within their own internal monologue and perception of the world, who is essentially kind of retreated inward and created it's like kind of like um it reminds me a lot of charlie kaufman's synecdoche new york in a certain sense because it's kind of like this this fable or this story about this male character who has essentially constructed this inner psychological world where his life plays out where he's able to control the people in his life and like move them about like marionettes and it tells the story of this this woman within this world who attempts to kind of break free of the trappings of this you know existence it's kind of like a meta story in a certain sense very Kaufman-esque and the presence of Martha Sky Murphy in terms of playing that character and the ways in which she translates the desire to be free of him and the way in which he translates the the intensity of how important it is that the illusion be maintained, the tension between the two of these. I mean, you have that, you know, increasingly um, intense vocal performance from Oliver, the front man, where they're, I'll play mine, I'll play mine, I'll play mine, over and over and over, louder and louder and louder, as she's just kind of screaming at the end of the song in ways that remind me of like Great Gig in the Sky by Pink Floyd. And it has just this intense sense of tension and swell and, and just 
absolutely explosive tonality and uh, I mean one of the best examples of storytelling in music this year I think and a real showcase for all of the best aspects of what Squid do. I think we were a little mixed on their album as a whole, but I think it was a uniformly agreed that when they were on at their best, like when they were making their best stuff, they were infusing this really exciting and, and talking heads influenced post-punk song with really thoughtful writing and meta writing and writing that kind of reckoned with uh, aspects of storytelling and character and, and what it is to be an artist and um, again with this track a kind of quite self-aware and sort of a hyper-conscious song about like the male artist dynamic that doesn't get too kind of in the weeds about the politics of it all but simply just kind of acknowledges the archetypes and the sort of stereotypes that have uh, you know uh, formed around that. So yeah, I, 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 it's and it's also just a fucking banger. Like it just goes hard. The 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 rhythm section of this band are so fucking locked in and crisp and tight. Production is absolutely fucking seamless. Uh, it's everything you could want from a song in this new sort of windmill scene wave of post punk this year. And um, I think, sadly, Black Country New Road not represented on our songs or albums list. But I think that this song stands as a the kind of exemplary work of the windmill scene in 2021 from the group of us uh, at, at its peak doing what that sort of sound does best and most thoughtfully moving straight on to number seven on our list and it's time to get sad when that hammer pulled back did you think of me you were the one that taught me how to be. Rockhampton came out with an album. They kind of, you know, they surprised everybody. They were like, bam, new album, two weeks from now, boom. And it came out and it was, you know, it was a hit amongst the members of the podcast. And frankly, I, I just, I, I've not, this has been in a permanent rotation all year and I've never stopped being impressed with it. The way this album continues its pace, the way it manages to balance the macro and micro themes of this band, but it is all epitomized on this final track here, The Light Part 2. You're not exactly starved for great choices for the best song on this album, but if I had to pick, it would probably be this, just because, yeah, it's the most emotionally effective thing on here. That's not to say that it doesn't sound great. It does. It sounds like, it, it sounds quintessentially Brockhampton, but it's something that doesn't sound like anything else they've ever made. The 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 sort of soft guitar strumming, the the pitched up almost choral vocals, just like it's a really simple sounding song, but it allows the emotion to carry it through. And you have, of course, Kevin coming on here and talking about you, you have the two sort of winding journeys that this album charts, which is Kevin's and Joba's. And Kevin talks about everything that's happened in the sense like in his life from like childhood on this song and delivers an incredibly heartfelt verse about trying to balance everything in his life trying to balance uh fame and artistry and the death of his loved ones and people he's trying to support and remembering where he comes from and it's an incredibly affecting moment but the the man of the hour here is Joba, who is the 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 runaway star of Roadrunner for me, and I think for many other people like this, uh, he very very uh, earnestly talks about the death of his father the previous year, who uh, shot himself, and it's really difficult to externalize why exactly it's it's you know it's sad, but like why it hits so hard and really it's just because job is a great lyricist uh he delivers it well as he always does but i think the thing for me is just the way he's able to put some sentiments like impermanence turned permanent with a nine is a lyric i'm i still think about every once in a while and i'm just like jesus and there's something to hearing joba who on an earlier brock hampton song talked about how proud he was of himself for pursuing art and music and becoming the the person that he is whereas his contemporaries were settling down and having kids 
And now that his father's gone, he talks about one day getting to have kids so that he can talk about how awesome that their grandfather was. And it, it, it's, it, it, it pulls on your heartstrings. And I feel like when people say stuff like that, that there's sort of an inherent concession that you say when it's just like, oh, well, it's emotionally affecting. So that's like a, it's, a, it's an appeal that exists outside the art. And that's why uh, like it affects you in that way, but it's not like the best constructed thing ever. And nothing could be further from the fucking truth. Um, I, I hate that that's been internalized in the world of broader criticism in terms of art because emotion is just as important as anything technical. And this song is why. I, I, I can't count the amount of times where I've just listened to this entire album and had a ball. And then this song, even though I'm anticipating it each time, comes around and I'm just fucking weeping by the time he finishes the final syllable on uh, the opening line of the verse where he says, when that hammer pulled back, did you think of me? It, it's just an astounding emotional achievement for the band and for Joba as an artist. And I am grateful that he was able to so purely distill such a painful experience so beautifully in a way that like charts his trajectory and the band's trajectory and it and it sort of embodies what makes Brockhampton great and what makes this these particular two artists who are sort of shining on this moment on this final track it's it's just a, a an incredibly soulful sentiment that helped sort of carry me through the year and on occasion Moving on to number six on our list, we have Lingua Ignata always been an artist associated with primal, brutal kind of expressions of human pain and suffering in the most visceral and vivid way. Pennsylvania Furnace completely turns your expectations of the kind of musical artist that Lingua Ignota is entirely on its head, because this is the complete uh, musical sonic inverse of what you've come to expect from Kristen Hader as in this project. Yet, while being the musical inverse of expectations, it absolutely matches, in my opinion, the emotional intensity and the power within performance that you get in the most screaming, kind of noisy, abrasive music that she has made in the past. Yet, Kristen's ability to translate and have you feel that intensity while keeping the arrangement so starkly understated is... One of the reasons why I think this is her greatest song, musical work to date, it, it translates some of the feelings of this record and some of the ideas of this record, which I won't get into right now. And through the image of this man in rural Pennsylvania in the 19th century who's forced to burn his dogs to survive. And this sense of everything burning, the sense of the fatalism, the nihilism of existence, and particularly an existence where one is not clearly beholden to a God who will, who is able to support, who is able to hold them, but a God who either is silent and non-existent or outright abusive and violent. And this was the first song that Kristen released ahead of the album, and in many ways, it set the tone and set the expectations for what this record was going to be, but also stood as a display of some of her most virtuosic performance to date. I mean, you have, it initially starts and ends with this very kind of like eerie sort of baritone intonations of the lyrics, but crests in its midpoint with some of her most soaring, loud and tuneful singing ever. Um, I know that this is a song that made your list as well, Jake, your top 10 also. Um, do you want to talk for a bit about what is so moving and intense about this song? I think that a lot of it, you know, I won't go too deeper into it because a lot of the reasons why Pennsylvania Furnace is great is why Center Get Ready is great. And one thing is that it's just how holistic the project itself feels and Pennsylvania Furnace is like the key as to why you can even say that in the first place. It comes at an inspired point in the album sequencing wise. 
and just sort of it's it's sort of just contained in that very center of the record where you kind of need a moment like that where there's sort of an instrumental like it's an it's an intense emotional song but it sort of relents away from the sort of aggressive instrumentals or even aggressive like intense performances it's something that's a little bit easier to digest so you can fully understand the emotional scope of all of it and again a lyric on here that I've just never been able to stop thinking about since I've heard it there's so many of these all across the year all across so many different albums but one thing that I learned is that everything burns I'm never going to be able to forget that line and I'm never going to be able to forget the way that she says it Let's move on now to the top five, our five favorite songs of 2021. And I mean, we're really getting into some deep shit now. I mean, we could not pretend that we're unbiased but also at the same time, as I think we've taken great pains to make clear every single time we've mentioned the music of Glacier Flower, which if for viewers who may not know, is the musical project of our very own August and his friend Mason. We've taken great pains to express that when we praise this music, it is not because we have this particular standard where it's like, well, this is great for this, you know, bedroom ambient project made by our friend like we're really impressed that our friend it's more than that this is genuinely the song we're going to shout out today and it won't surprise you as well to hear that the album that's on will also be in our best albums video but this particular song until we meet again is genuinely one of the most beautiful songs of the year one of the most beautiful ambient songs i've heard in a long time i'm sure i would get a cosign there uh the album itself Uh is is a record that goes through a number of different emotional waves and and, and tones and feelings and we'll get into that a little bit more later on but Jake I want you to kind of talk a little bit about what this particular song is until we meet again because you have a particularly special connection to this song I mean it's and I'm sure you can reveal um, why I'm asking you to talk about this song first in particular. Well uh, as if to further emphasize Tyler's point here is that if viewers know me in any respect is that if there's one thing you will always count on from Jake it's full honesty it's never exa- it might not exactly be delivered in the 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 purest or more most succinct way possible but I'm going to mean every word of it and I would not put a song that I did not wholeheartedly adore at my, my number one spot for my favorite song of the year if I did not think it was the best song of the year. And I said, when we reviewed this album, that nothing was gonna top this. And I was fucking right, because nothing did. This song is, honestly, it's kind of fascinating just because it's my pick, even though, relatively speaking, this is the simplest song on this album. There is, like, there are so many moving parts to songs like, Like I'm Not Even There, or Tristitia ex Nihilo, where there's these really, really specific collisions of sonic ideas that happen on this record that you can sort of point to and you can sort of draw like a specific desired effect from it or just a way that it affects you. Whereas Until We Meet Again is plaintive. It's, it's a great, it's at a great point on the album. It's sort of the perfect come down after like I'm not even there, but it's like this, it's this simple, very elegant tone that just sort of melts in real time. And it like the, the variation on it that it goes through is super, super subtle. It reminds me a lot of the work of Harold Budd, which you will be, no one will be shocked to learn that, that that's why I really love it so much. I'm a really big fan of his, probably my favorite ambient musician. Um, but it's the progression here, which again, it's nothing particularly complicated, um, but the way it manages to move from segment to segment, which is what makes it so beautiful. The, the really, really faint key, like piano keys in the very middle of the song, the way you can sort of hear the, the white noise crest on that final third of the song, which is just 
unexplainably heartbreaking for some reason. I still haven't been able to fully understand this song. And I kind of think that's why I love it so much is that it's still something that's sort of giving something to me. It sounds like, it just sort of sounds like existing within another world, which is as a whole why Glacier Flower 21 is great. I've listened to this album as much as I've listened to any album this year. Um, it's been it's been so great for just needing to, to come down. And I love every song here. I need to stress that. And I'm sure I'll make that more evident on the albums list. But it's this one that I've come back to out of context many times. Like I've probably listened to this album 20, 25 times this year. But when I want just a sort of like taste of it, and I, I, I come back to this song, I'll just sort of lay down and just bathe in it. And once it gets to that sort of final segment where you hear a little bit of a field recording in it, it's so freeing. It's so, it, it's, it, there, there's something about this song that just oozes emotional catharsis. Um, even if it's like, it just tonally, it, it's just so, so specifically beautiful in that way. And it makes me feel like sad and reflective, but also like there's a there's there's a distinct layer of hope in that sort of faint piano melody that's near the end of this. It's it's like it's only like three or four notes and it's really dragged out, but it just goes to show you how much thought can be put into such a simple song. Because if anything here was arranged differently then it just, it wouldn't be the, the titanic emotional fucking dump truck that it ends up being. I love this song so much so that if, you know, if, if you all pay attention to me, you'll know I'm a writer. I, I, I write uh, books. I, I finished a book series this year and I had a weird moment where I wrote a lot to Glacier Flower 21 this year and I listened specifically to Until We Meet Again in the final chapter that I wrote for my book series this year. And I listened to it over and over again because it captures the essence of the tone of the final scene. And I didn't know what sentence to end it on. And I was just so fucking perplexed. I was just like, this is 240,000 words long and I don't know how to end this fucking book series. And I just sort of looked at the song and was like, hmm. I just ended it with Until We Meet Again because it felt right. August Mason, thank you. I'd like to talk very briefly about my pick, uh, which was Like I'm Not Even There, which uh, I think it's so brilliantly sequenced, as Jake mentions, just because that is like, that song is like the sound of dissociation, particularly dissociation in public. And... Mm -hmm following that with until we meet again just makes the catharsis of that song so much sweeter let's move swiftly along to our number four pick on the list of the best songs of 2021 and once again we have something so podcore that it's an indisputed <laughs> favorite for so many of us <laughs> This song is another one that's distinctly cleaved into two halves. It's more atmospheric uh, Americana post metal inspired half. And then it's straight up black metal half, which are, are both interesting on their own, particularly, I, I mean, the black metal side of this song has just pulsating, pounding, uh, drums, guitars, it is overwhelming. And then the front half of this song is something so entirely distinct and unique on this album. It is reason enough to, to single this out as uh, a very significant track, most, mostly because it is the one where we get some uh, guest vocalists on here particularly Eric Mogridge, who is just one of the best working metal vocalists today. Damn right. Who has just an absolutely beautiful transcendent voice, which carries this first half into the 
ethereal beauty that it is. And I mean, he does also provide some choir parts on the latter intenser black metal half of this song. And it's it's just one of these songs that feels like this great release of tension of the tension and stress that's been building throughout the album in a way that's particularly tough to put into words because of how it's one of those things similar to Paranual this year where you have to feel it you have to really grasp this untangible emotionality conveyed through the suggestions of words throughout this song throughout this album at that but yeah it's just a really beautiful hard-hitting climax penultimate song that is so enrapturing to listen to so haunting at, at parts almost seductive in its beauty uh great song I'll throw in a little thing uh, because uh, one of my favorite songs of the year that uh, sort of um, in the same vein is the song Dead Loons, which is the second song on here. Uh, And look, I was over the moon about this album when we talked about it, but I was never able to concisely really explain why beyond sort of those vague terms and August just spoke to why that's kind of difficult but managed to very concisely put why Embers at Dawn is the great track that it is and I only chose Dead Loons because this is like my placeholder pick for the whole album because I think every song on this album is perfect there's no song that I think I like more on here so I was like what's the song that embodies this experience the best for me. And it was Dead Loons because it begins with that sort of continuing stretch from the opening song of just being like very plaintive. There's like a piano sort of melody that's going on here. It's like, it's a dark place to begin the proper album on. And then that sort of doomy section comes in right afterwards. And you're just like, whoa, okay. And then the section after that is maybe my favorite 45 seconds of music in this entire year when the fucking strings come in syncopated with the guitars and the drums and like I can't explain to you why but I this made me weep when I heard it I put I bought a good pair of headphones just to listen to the flag files of this in the best quality possible and I was listening to that and it came on and it was just like it has such a really tight melody to it which anchors you into this entire album which is mired in, in, in darkness and it's it's a lot of it's difficult to grasp onto because of the production and all of that but my god there is nothing that will make you feel as purely liberated as the catharsis you will feel on a track like dead loons all right well we move into <sighs> the top three songs of the year and at number three it is of course frankly i feel a little unqualified to explain what's so great about little sims in general uh but i i do feel pretty qualified to explain what's so great about introvert which is the first track on her album from this year sometimes i might be introvert and i feel qualified in particular because i've listened to it roughly eight thousand times (laughs) I turned it on today and it was still just like, my God, I just, let's take Sims' rapping ability and flow and presence aside for a second and just talk about how fucking God mode this song sounds like the, the, like just the huge symphonic orchestration <laughs> so smoothly into that That's slick true, ass like finger picked guitar part into the verses and like I just what who are you who is doing I mean, this when, when, the last time an intro track was this good at declaring an artistic presence and just good in general at announcing the arrival of an artist was like what to pimp a butterfly I mean like fuck that's some pretty high praise. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, you hit the nail on the head there. It's just, 
a definitive statement of purpose. It, it's like unquestionably the best song on this album. And Tyler is going to say like, well, it's only in the bottom half. No, oh, fuck you. <laughs> Eat shit. It's a great song. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, fuck off. You'd say that. My, my favorite. My favorite. <laughs> My, my favorite. I mean, song. he didn't have to put it like that, but w- is he wrong? Sure, fine, good, good, <laughs> good, good roast session there. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not my, my, my favorite song in the album is Woman, but I can't take a single thing away from Introvert. It is every bit the declarative statement of purpose and the beautiful, you know, distillation of artistic identity that you would want from an artist like Sims at this juncture of her career. It's um, the strings are gorgeous. They call back to Unfinished Sympathy by Massive Attack to me mm. and it feels like an update of so much of the most sort of anthemic and ambitious and, and surging string laden hip hop of the alternative in that era, but modernizing it for 2021 with, you know, the, the influence of soul and funk legends like D'Angelo weaved into it as well. It's amazing. All right, well, now we go to number two on our list. We're almost there. Silver medal. Silver medal, Al- the silver medal song, which is... Your lip was trembling when you said that we are cursed. If you told me this wouldn't be my song of the year or my second favorite song of the year in the week that this album came out, I would have punched you in the face. No, I wouldn't have done that. I, I, I would have, um, I would straight up have had a difficult time believing you because for a while I thought this might be the greatest sort of piece of singer songwriter uh, indie rock I have ever heard, and that, that within that specific niche anyway of the storytelling vein. Uh, to me, this is this is to me what like basically every song on Pressure Machine is to Morgan. Like it is this heart-wrenching emotional story rendered so vividly through such beautiful um, descriptions and imagistic scenes that are set for you with biological flourishes and with narrative details that completely gut and, and rend your insides apart. It's a story of Fuck, it's hard for me to even fucking start to talk about this without wanting to cry because I have cried so much listening to this song this year, little bleeding heart bitch that I am. Um, it's a song about young gay love that can't be. And sure, we've had a lot of stories in that vein before. It's almost its own kind of like archetype uh, when it comes to like queer stories and art. But the way Lucy tells it, she is a born storyteller. Anyone will, who's listened to her music will tell you that. Whether you enjoy the music itself or not, there's no disputing that she's beautiful at rendering a story and selecting detail and deploying it in ways to maximize the emotional impact and to connect you with the characters in that story in the most maximal way. I think all of us could learn a lesson from Lucy in terms of how to write characters, in terms of how to render details within a scene, not even in terms of what information to include to make music powerful, but what information to not include. And the idea of inclusion and exclusion is beautifully displayed as well on a song like Thumbs, which, I mean, when that song came out, I would have had a difficult time believing it wouldn't be the Lucy Dacus song of the year. And and yet here we are, um, Jake and I both in agreement that this is the standout. Um, Again, like, Home video is a, is a masterclass in this kind of storytelling, but Triple Dog Deer, which is the closing track on that record, is a song about that feels like a full circle moment with regard to all of the sort of childhood stories that are told on tracks like VBS and tracks like Christine and, and First Time. Uh, in terms of Lucy's experience growing up and reckoning with a queer identity and also with a kind of the kind of loss of innocence that comes with often having to suppress or hide or evade certain aspects of who you are, who you want to be, uh, realizing yourself, realizing the fact that childhood relationships and friendships can't last forever as well, and often don't, are often kind of doomed. And the tender line between a a friendship 
that is intimate and close and meaningful and a romantic connection and relationship when you're at a specific age as a teenager and you have a particular connection to a friend in your life and you reckon with you know what actually is the nature of that connection and how do I deal with my feelings and even understand them I think the greatest song of all time to approach this specific theme is Sufjan Stevens the predatory wasp of the palisades but Lucy Dacus's triple dog deer is every bit as good at it as this as that song is and I, I won't I don't want to spend too much time on this for time's sake, but every single verse here, you have specific details of the story that unfurl and just tighten the fucking grip around your heart until this fantasy of escape at the end of the song. And this gorgeous line that's maybe one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking sentiments of translating what grief feels like whether it's grief for losing a relationship, grief for losing a friend, grief for someone not being in your life anymore, which is the line, nothing worse could happen now. Not a lot of music that really tries to approach grief focuses on the strange and unnatural feeling experiences that happen besides just pure sadness when you are grieving. And this idea of relief at the burden of an emotional whirlwind being lifted from you, even though it's also resulted in the end of something beautiful, is something that few storytellers, I think, even really fully understand, let alone are able to convey and communicate as well as Lucy does. And, and yeah, this song is a fucking masterclass in, in emotion, in humanity, in psychology, in storytelling, in everything you could possibly hope for from a singer-songwriter track. Yes. Let's do it. Let's kill the beast. Let's slay the dragon. Let's finally do it. Our favorite song of 2021, the song of the year. And really, in retrospect, once I saw that this was what it was, it felt like it couldn't be anything else, which is the best feeling for a best song of the year list, right? When you know the number one was born to be there. And of course, it is. Truly, I never stop winning. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to sort of separate this from the album itself and to talk about it in isolation, um, just because obviously this is probably going to feature on our album's video. Go, go, look forward to that. It's, but it's especially hard to do with this because this song, um, which I believe is sort of technically tied with um, Infinite Josh, the song that immediately comes before it, is uh, uh, difficult because this is essentially the entire final third of the record because it takes up about 35 minutes. Um, and these songs encompass so many different ideas and themes and movements that it's 
it's I, I I could like listen to it while I'm explaining and I would still fail to be able to like capture the breadth of what happens here. But it is the, the, the final track and as such it really leans into the both post-rock and progressive rock sort of leanings that this band have decided to sort of adopt on this album. They've, they've maximizing both genres and they sort of do like, you know, the first half is this really like, it's a buildup. I think we both compared it to Godspeed You Black Emperor when we reviewed it. The way this starts and it's just absolutely like, it just, the second it begins and you sort of hear these ethereal chimes and the sort of spoken word section begins you just know this is going to be an all-timer from the get-go especially when you see the runtime of it being 20 fucking minutes long but it sort of has that you know the the very plain very soft uh opening section and then it builds and builds with the strings that follow after it that just sort of rise it up further and further. And each segment of this song lasts exactly as long as it needs to, to capitalize on the emotions that it's striving for. And it builds and it builds and it sounds great. By the time the drums have fully incorporated their rhythmic contribution to the song and the singer is finally sort of beginning to properly sing and the guitar when the guitar comes in which is one of the best guitar tones i've ever fucking heard it's all across this album and it's just so electric and sharp sounding and once it comes in it's it is the feeling of levitating above the earth at like nine thousand feet and seeing everything and it's it's not even the best part of the song you it, it, it keeps going through this particular movement and then it sort of slows down and it fakes you out for a moment and you think it's gonna end and you're just like, what? what, there's like four more minutes in this song. What the fuck is happening here? And then it comes in and there's like a new segment of the song where the female vocalist comes in and this encompasses thematically the entirety of the record, um, which I will go more into when we talk about the whole record. But when you have the, her sort of repeated refrains going over and over again, when I first listened to this in my car, when I was driving home and I was just like, there was sort of a, a melody that I heard and I was just like, I, I recognize this. I've heard this somewhere before. This like build up here, this sounds, this sounds like getting sodas. And then, 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 <laughs> At the very end of the song, they repeat the chorus from the final song, one of my favorite songs of all time, off of Whenever, If Ever, and they do the chorus, the world is a beautiful place and we have to make it that way. And, you know, if everyone belongs here, we'll make it more than just a shelter. And it's just repeated over and over again. And the instrumental is just at the perfect place. And it's just, it's just the most i have felt all year listening to anything i can't even tell you it's like the happy sad whatever it defies designation or explanation and it is 100 percent musical euphoria the likes of which i don't think like you you might not ever come across what like you know you listening to this i'm sure you love music i bet you you have probably felt as overwhelmingly joyous as I did when I listened to this maybe once in your life. And yes, I'm speaking for you. Fuck you. I love this song so much. And the thing is, is that I, I tried to sort of get into it, but I was really tired when we reviewed this uh, particular album. Uh, but the meaningfulness of reincorporating Getting Sodas, it's not just like a fan service thing. The reason I find that chorus so meaningful when you put it in on this song is sort of the refrain and the incorporation of the band's title which is um if you're afraid to die then so am i which you know like you just sort of listening to the lyrics and just like oh it's a little clever spin but like the thing is about this album is that the overwhelming theme of it is perseverance and to put in a line like that at the very very end if you're afraid to die, then so am I. What that means is that if you're afraid to die, you want to fucking be alive with people. 
and that means everything. This is... <laughs> God, fuck. I, and if I can wrap up my thoughts on it as to why, just not even as to why, just to encapsulate the appeal of this particular song, there's a spoken word segment at the very start of this. And I'm going to read a little bit of it. Sometimes jail keepers beg for their freedom from those who they've held captive. And sometimes we're dynamite. I miss the one whose skin was the same as mine. I miss the one who gave me my name. I'm guilty and repentant of so many things. I am absolved and unrepentant of so many others. These hands that once held theirs would like to be of use. The memories of what they can do have not faded. They split my palms and yours to take something precious from us that we don't have words for anymore, but we try to fight it anyway. Exhausted and trying to shield our eyes from the glare of all the violence bouncing off of more violence to try and make sense of the world. Violence made for those who plan our obsolescence. These hands would like to be of use with yours. And I don't think there's a section of this album that embodies what it's about better than that. The car is on fire and there's no driver behind the wheel. Um, <laughs> um, it's like the inverse of that feeling. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up our 20 favorite songs of the year video. Let us know at home what your favorite songs of the year are. What do you think of the songs that we've discussed today? Uh, what songs you would have liked to have seen on this list? Um, whatever your thoughts are, we want to see your lists as well. So make sure you hit us up with your lists in the comments too. We love seeing other people's takes and perspectives and lists especially. So um, we're definitely going to be super interactive with you guys if you do choose to leave us a comment. So uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, if you enjoy the video as well, make sure you remember to hit the like button too. That really helps us out a lot. Uh, if you're already subscribed to us, then thanks so much. If you're not, then we'd love it if you'd consider that. But obviously up to you. Uh, if you do want to support us in any in a more meaningful way as well, you could always hit the join button and spend just one buck per month to support us and help us out. Obviously optional, but our whole entire hearts will go to you exclusively if you choose to do that. So it's not uh, optional. And Give us some money. And you'll also get a your name in the lead and intro of every video we make as well. So that's I, 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 that, yeah. If that means something to you, then that's something that you can get quite easily. What did it um, say in that letter? Uh, yeah. What did it say? It said, "Yeah, give us some money." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, Morgan Mullaney. Um, but yeah, stick around <laughs> in, in two days' time for our best albums of the year list, which is sure to not overlap with this video, mm -hmm. anyway. right? Uh, and, and we'll absolutely be an absolute fucking corker. What will our album of the year be? If real ones know us, you can probably predict it, but feel free to throw your predictions in the comments below as well. We want to hear from you. And yeah, that's basically all there is to it. August, take us away. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Oberwise, naturally, you'll taste the difference. <laughs>